life. Uh, hello everyone at home, welcome back to another Wednesday evening at Cambridge University Astronomy. Um, I'm afraid our bad run of weather luck continues and we have no stargazing for you, uh, but we are going to more than make up for it with a very fascinating talk. So our speaker tonight is Dr. Uh, Dr. Ibuke Kupcha Yoldash, who is going to tell us all about gamma ray bursts and how we explore the universe using these deadly explosions. Uh, so over to you, Ibuke. Thank you, Matt. So yes, so I'll be giving you some uh, fascinating, hopefully, information about these uh, very powerful um, explosions. So this is a real um, observation, real data. And as you can see, um, these bursts basically happen only for a few seconds to tens of seconds. But during that time, they um, lighten up the entire gamma ray sky. So they are very, very powerful um, explosions. Um, and gamma rays, just to give a, a recap, um, are basically very um, energetic light, um, high frequency, high energy light. Um, and the light is basically a very um, large um, electromagnetic spectrum. And we only see a little bit of it, the visible light. And um, one on the one end, on the high energy end, lies the gamma rays, and on the lower energy range um, lies the radio waves, and um, like the FM and AM for those who are old enough to remember. Um, and uh, so the gamma ray bursts happen uh, in gamma rays. So they, there are these uh, explosions that are happening in very high energy gamma rays, um, lightening up the entire sky. Um, they were first discovered in 1967, so they're relatively new. And, um, and they were actually discovered during um, um, when the nuclear um, explosion surveillance. So while the satellites were, were surveilling the Earth uh, um, to detect any um, you know, um, nuclear explosion um, trials. Um, but these were coming, these bursts were coming from the, from the space. But um, it's quite difficult to pinpoint the direction, um, the exact location of the uh, gamma rays. And um, so therefore, we actually didn't know until um, 1997 uh, what these were. So and in 1997, um, the Compton um, uh, satellite um, was uh, started observing. And, um, after the gamma rays, it detected X-rays and visible light and other um, um, wavelength light um, coming from the same location. And that's how we started to learn much more about what the gamma ray bursts are. So, oh, I don't know why this one is not showing, sorry. So there is an afterglow um, emission from the gamma rays. As I said, basically there is uh, some, again, um, sort of bursting light that decays um, um, within a few minutes to a few day, days in, in um, X-rays uh, for, uh, for some um, gamma ray bursts. It's also visible in um, optical, so visible light, infrared, and even radio. So, and um, it also decays, they all decay in time and um, disappear eventually. And this is why we called afterglow. They just happen right after the gamma ray burst itself. And we also know they, oh, sorry. Oh, there it is. Oop. And they also happen in, in galaxies. Um, so this should be the one, yeah. Um, basically, as you can see, this one is actually the gamma ray burst in the optical and near infrared light, and uh, it actually lies on one of the spiral arms of this galaxy, so it fades away. Um, the, this is the afterglow emission in the um, visible light and near infrared light, and once it fades away, we can see the galaxy much better with this uh, spiral arms. Um, this is the, one of the images taken with the Hubble telescope. We also know that they are, they belong to kind of, um, they are divided into two categories um, according to their duration, the duration of the actual um, gamma ray uh, explosion, the burst. Um, roughly the ones that are shorter than two seconds 
are called short gamma ray bursts and um, longer than two seconds are called long gamma ray bursts. And this is not only because there is this uh, distinct division in terms of duration, but also they have some other um, different properties. Um, for instance, the short gamma ray bursts don't necessarily um, show that much of uh, um, afterglow emission and they are the burst itself uh, um, seems to be in harder gamma rays. And, um, and we also see supernova explosion at the same time or right after basically during the optical afterglow phase of the gamma ray burst for the long duration gamma, um, gamma ray burst for some of these. So I'll just open a parenthesis here to tell you what the or to remind you basically what supernova is. And um, so when we have a look at the life of the stars, um, so for most of the stars, right, there are some very small uh, or, or giant exceptions. Um, so there are like um, two main paths of their life cycle. They start as a small star like our sun and turn into a red giant, then turn into a planetary nebula and then become a white dwarf. And if this white dwarf has a partner, if it is a binary star system, basically, um, it can accumulate, the white dwarf um, takes uh, material onto itself from, the, from its uh, companion star. And eventually there is a, what we call a type 1a supernova, basically it explodes leaving nothing behind. Um, whereas um, for bigger stars, um, it's similar. It, it turns into what we call red supergiant. But then after that, um, there is the supernova, um, what we call core collapse supernova happens and uh, leaving behind either a neutron star or a black hole. So we see this core collapse supernova um, sometimes together with the gamma ray bursts, uh, the long duration gamma ray bursts. So this is a, a short video. Um, it's just an animation about the core collapse supernova, but it's basically when, the, when these big stars um, burn all of its fuel, um, at the end, there is nothing left to overcome the gravitational pull. So it explodes and throws away all the outer layers of the star, but the, the core of the star um, then cannot overcome the gravity and um, basically collapses onto itself, making either a neutron star or a black hole, depending on the initial uh, mass uh, of the star. So as we knew, there were there are these two main ways, explosive ways to die. One is the when the white dwarf um, has a companion star and then it accumulates so much uh, material that it just explodes and um, blowing apart with nothing left behind. And the other is the um, core collapse supernova when the giant star explodes and the, its core turns into a neutron star or a black hole. But then when we, um, observe more and more gamma ray bursts, we um, realized that um, there is an, an, another event happening for some of these uh, large stars. So when if the star, um, as far as uh, we can uh, predict from the observations, if it is a very large one, like 30, 40 times the, um, the mass of the sun, um, and if it is a, uh, if it has some uh, other additional properties, it can not only produce this supernova at the end of its life cycle, but also this gamma ray burst, which is like a, again throwing jet um, like uh, material, the, its outer layers, but it, this time in a um, jet um, in the two directions, and uh, much more actually powerful than the supernova explosion itself. So it's much brighter and much more powerful. So yeah, this is uh, basically what we know about gamma ray bursts. So the, the and um, as I said, the short and long division is not just the duration, um, but the other properties, which we um, then know that the long duration gamma ray bursts, the long gamma ray bursts, um, as I said, is these uh, massive stars, these giant stars collapsing onto itself and then basically throwing the outer layers in a, in a jet. And the short duration gamma ray bursts are actually binary stars. 
And uh, <clears throat> these binary stars um, eventually, the, the, the two neutron stars or a black hole and a neutron star basically, um, and they eventually um, um, get closer and closer and collide into each other and uh, form the um, gamma ray bursts, short gamma ray bursts. And these are actually the ones that are also observed by the um, gravitational wave detectors. So, yeah, this is a short animation about how this um, jet explosion happens. So we can see the, the big star and then it slowly um, starts to kind of throw the outer layers in a jet stream. And then um, during that stream, there are some collisions between that material due to different speeds, which then um, forms the, the, um, the gamma rays and, and the afterglow basically emission once it collides with the material right outside the star, the, the shell and, and the uh, material um, surrounding the star. And then, yeah, we see it as a, basically a big explosion in the gamma rays first. So this is the roughly the physics. Obviously, I won't go into the details, but uh, as I said, the, um, the gamma ray burst itself is due to the um, collision of the, of the um, basically shock emission uh, from, of the ejected material by just basically different uh, uh, speed the material collides uh, and uh, then we see the gamma ray burst and then once it uh, hits the uh, material near the star this jet uh, the ejector hits the material near the star it also um, emits this afterglow emission in all the other light wavelengths, light uh, um, different uh, energy light from uh, X-rays, optical to radio. But that's not the only. I, I mean, this is there is a lot of um, sort of interesting physics going on with the gamma ray bursts. Obviously, they are the most um, energetic, most extreme explosions uh, that single stars uh, produce, and so they are very interesting uh, laboratories of physics, but that's not the only thing that is interesting about them. So part of the title of my talk was exploring the universe using these deadly explosions. And uh, the reason we can do this is basically um, gamma rays comes, um, we can detect gamma rays um, irrelevant of their, um, distance to us. Uh, so I'll just come to that in a moment. But as I said, gamma rays occur in, in galaxies. And once they fade away, we can actually observe the galaxy and, and um, get uh, study the, the galaxies. And um, here, actually, uh, on the right hand side, there are some um, images uh, of different gamma ray burst galaxies, host galaxies, as we call them. And there are all types of um, galaxies. Some are very faint, some are big, some are small, some are irregular, some are spiral galaxies like our uh, Milky Way. So basically um, they can happen more or less in any type of galaxy, which means we can actually use these gamma ray bursts to, um, to observe and, and study um, galaxy, the evolution of galaxies in time, or or actually detect the faint galaxies that we wouldn't normally see in um, sky surveys. Um, one other thing is, um, as I said, the gamma rays can go through the universe without being absorbed, which means that they can be very far away, and we can still um, see the gamma ray bursts, which is not the case, unfortunately, for other. Uh, wavelengths, um, mostly the um, the optical and infrared, um, the the other galaxies uh, in between us will absorb that and, and um, sometimes re-emit in in different light. But it means that we can't actually see um, everything, all all the different wavelengths light coming towards us. Um, but for the gamma rays, we can. So we can actually use these gamma ray bursts to discover far, far away galaxies. Um, 
and also, as I said, to study the faint ones that we cannot uh, detect otherwise. So how can we do this is, um, so it's only not far, far away, but it's also, it means it happened in the past because the speed of light is constant. So we can actually, um, when we observe far away galaxies, it means that we are actually seeing uh, galaxies that were formed uh, um, much uh, long ago, actually um, closer to the Big Bang, much closer to the Big Bang, to the early universe than us. And this is basically, as I said, due to the speed of light being constant. So I am just showing here um, a very basic calculation. Um, for instance, our sun, yeah, our star sun is roughly 150 million kilometers away from the Earth. So when the sun, when the light starts its journey from sun to us, uh, it needs to travel this 150 million kilometers to reach the Earth. And as we know from basic physics, uh, the velocity is the distance uh, over time, so the, uh, the time that this journey takes. And so we can calculate how long it takes for that light um, that starts its journey from sun um, to reach us uh, to, at Earth. So it's basically the distance, which is roughly 150 uh, million kilometers divided by the speed of light, which is roughly um, 300,000 kilometers per second. So if we do this simple uh, calculation, we find roughly 500 seconds. So when the um, light um, starts its journey from the sun, it takes uh, 500 seconds for it to reach us, which is um, roughly um, eight minutes. Um, so think about much further uh, away objects. So when, when a star is uh, far, far away from us, this is, you know, like this is the near, nearest star to us, the sun. And, uh, and these gamma ray bursts happen in, in other galaxies. So, you know, and we are talking about much further distances. So it, the light takes uh, you know, millions of years to reach us, which means basically we are seeing the universe uh, when it was uh, um, millions of years ago. Um, so obviously it's for the universe, the calculation of the distance is a bit more complicated because um, as we know, the universe is expanding which means the distances actually increase over time. So it's not constant. So we have to take into account that calculation. And also due to the Doppler shift, um, the light uh, also changes its uh, wavelength when it's, I mean, um, it starts its journey at a certain wavelength, but then um, shifts to red um, uh, before it reaches us because of the expanding universe. But uh, so there is some additional um, physics going on, but the um, basic idea is still due to the speed of light being constant. And so we can use gamma ray bursts, um, as I said, to learn more about the early universe. And um, at the moment, the farthest known gamma ray burst um, is with a, what we call this cosmological redshift of 8.2 which is uh, about uh, 9,000 megaparsec away, which um, comes up to roughly 27 times 10 to the 22 kilometer away. So um, yeah, I don't know if there is a name. I, I think the um, largest I know is the, <laughs> I want to, go, want to go into the, you know, PETA or so. So it's like, a, you know, uh, 10 to the seven, quadrillion or something kilometers away. So and, and when we calculate this in terms of time that has passed, uh, um, it's basically took light about three, uh, 13 uh, billion years to reach us. And uh, so it's, our universe is like 13.7 um, uh, billion years old. So it's this far, uh, far away gamma ray burst here. You can see the, the infrared afterglow of it. Um, has happened only 630 million years after the Big Bang, actually. So there, it is uh, um, really um, fascinating in that sense to be able to um, pinpoint these um, stars. And sometimes uh, if you're lucky enough uh, and have uh, really powerful instruments, the, the galaxies that were among the, you know, um, 
first galaxies in the universe uh, even. So how we do it, I just want to spend a couple more minutes on how we do this. Basically, um, yeah, so this is again the light spectrum, the electromagnetic spectrum. As I said, um, so we first observe them uh, in the gamma rays, that is the one that can reach us without any problems. But lucky for us, for human beings and for the life on Earth, um, our atmosphere actually blocks the gamma rays and most of the X-rays and ultraviolet. So we have to um, use satellites, uh, astronomical satellites um, uh, with uh, gamma ray and X-ray and the UV telescopes on them to be able to observe these. Um, and we can do optical and um, some of the near infrared observations on Earth. Some of the infrared uh, spectrum, we again need uh, satellites in the space, and then we can observe the, the radio uh, wavelengths, the radio afterglow, for instance, um, on, on Earth as well. And um, so these are basically a few of the instruments I myself used for the um, gamma ray burst research I did. Um, one is uh, um, GROND, which was is uh, now decommissioned, unfortunately. Um, it is a visible and near infrared uh, detector. It had like, a, it was able to observe in seven um, different uh, light wavelengths at the same time. And this was mounted on, on Chile. As I said, this is the, uh, the um, Compton Gamma Ray Observatory, which was uh, the first one to um, observe the, um, the X-ray afterglow of the um, gamma ray bursts, which then meant we could learn much more about them. And uh, the current uh, SWIFT satellite, the Neil Garrell SWIFT satellite, is the one um, that is doing gamma ray, X-ray, and visible light observations. Um, this was particularly designed to observe uh, gamma ray bursts and their afterglows. And you can see my uh, virtual background here, the very large telescopes in Chile. And again, this, these are you know, used for many, many purposes, but um, we use them to study the um, galaxies that um, hosted GRBs, gamma ray bursts, and uh, visible and infrared light. And this is again um, in Chile, the ALMA um, telescope array. And um, this is the sub-millimeter, millimeter observation close to the radio wavelengths. Um, but yeah, and there are many more, many more telescopes and, and uh, satellites but basically what you need for the gamma ray burst research is that to have a gamma ray satellite and an x-ray one to pinpoint uh, the x-ray afterglow to to use the x-ray afterglow to pinpoint the location of the gamma ray burst and then we use the telescopes on earth um, big or small to study the further properties and i think that's it from me any questions Wonderful. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Ivoke. That was absolutely wonderful. Um, so there are some questions coming through. I'll say to anyone that has not asked a question yet, um, if you stick the question down there in the YouTube chat, I will make sure um, our speaker will get to it. Um, so um, going from the top, uh, someone uh, would like to know, um, and feel free not to answer this because I know you didn't mention this during your talk, but about um, cold spots in the CMB and what might that mean uh, for... Uh, <laughs> for I would have loved to answer yeah. that, but <laughs> the cosmology is not my area of expertise. I would, you know, like, uh, I don't think... Um, no, that, that's absolutely fine. I just, I yeah. don't, if you had any thoughts on it, but yes, no, I, I, it's not my area either, right? I, I wouldn't yeah. have to start with um, So we do have a question from Wayne. Underwood, um, who uh, was fascinated by the idea that when a binary system goes supernova, there's nothing left at all. So does that mean that all of the matter gets converted into energy? Yeah, so it's not all binary systems to clarify that, sorry. It's only when it's a white dwarf and, and a normal star, basically, um, and eventually mm -hmm. the, the white dwarf accumulates the matter, uh, and a certain amount of matter, and um, there, other physical processes, but basically, yeah, it all uh, explodes and converted is converted into energy. And there is some um, uh, sometimes the nebula, 
some matter lying around, but there is nothing resembling a star or no neutron star or even a black hole left. I mean, that's just an enormous amount of energy, right? Just yes, an is. entire star. Yeah, yeah supernova, type 1a supernova are very powerful and, and they have also um, some certain properties that enables us to use them as, uh, you know, candles basically to um, study cosmology. Mm. Um, a question has come through, which I think you did mention in your talk. Maybe you could just remind us, uh, what is the largest redshift of a gamma ray burst that we've observed? Yeah, so the, the, the largest one we know that is being con uh, that was confirmed spectroscopically. Um, so there are different ways of uh, measuring redshift. And uh, the most secure way is the spectroscopic redshift, uh, where, where we can um, see the light in much more detail in, in um, small um, bins of uh, small sections of wavelength. So we, we know for sure uh, where it is coming from and its, its properties basically of, of the um, of its source. So the, the largest one that is confirmed in that way is the uh, 8.2, the GRB 0409-0423, I think the gamma ray bursts are named um, by the date they happen. So 0409-0423 is the 23rd of April 2009, yeah. And there are some um, other GRBs. There is a redshift um, bigger than nine one, but unfortunately that was only, the redshift was only calculated photometrically, um, which is um, when you don't, when you see um, the light in certain filters like infrared, and then you don't see anything in the optical, for instance, then you can roughly estimate the, the redshift. Mm, excellent, thank you. Um, I will say there are lots of comments uh, coming through saying they very much enjoyed your talk and they enjoyed the way you presented the spectrum. Uh, people found it very nice. Um, can you talk at all uh, about whether gamma rays might have an effect on the weather here on Earth? Oh yeah, well, I mean, um, so these ones that are basically what we call cosmological, they are happening in other galaxies um, um, which don't have any effect on us. So that it has to be quite nearby to, um, to have the effect on our atmosphere. So far, we haven't detected any in our galaxy, um, which is possibly a lucky thing. But I mean, um, uh, again, to apart from, I would say, um, small disruptions, it wouldn't have any major effect unless it is very nearby. Um, okay, um, so a question from Jessica, um, who wants to know about the redshifts. Um, so do the gamma rays get redshifted as they travel through the universe? Um, yes, but uh, because the what we call gamma rays is basically a very, very um, large portion of the electromagnetic spectrum, the light spectrum, um, their redshifting doesn't affect uh, that much. So what we use uh, to measure the, the distance and, uh, of these uh, stars is uh, usually the, um, the visible and infrared light because uh, we can observe the effect of the redshift much better there. And also because uh, we can, uh, and I was saying this word spectrum, we can um, have a much more detailed spectrum. So see the, the light coming from, um, from, you know, like with individual energies or wavelengths uh, in much more detail um, than in gamma ray bursts. Um, so in, in visible light and in infrared, um, in, we can see these in much more detail. So that's how, what we use to determine the redshift, hence the distance. Um, wonderful. Um, so there, there are questions coming in thick and fast. Are you, are you okay to stay and answer? Yeah, 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 I'm happy to. Um, so uh, Sylvia would like to know, um, how much more do you think we have to learn about uh, gamma rays and gamma ray bursts? So, I mean, um, there are um, <clears throat> certain aspects of them. For instance, um, some of these short duration gamma ray bursts that are shorter than two seconds that we think are uh, due to binary star to neut neutron stars, for instance, uh, collapsing into each other. We see, for instance, um, for, from some of them uh, now, thanks to LIGO and Virgo, we see the gravitational waves. So 
these two coming together gives us much more information about the physics. Some, for instance, are thought to be connected to um, now um, what we call um, soft gamma ray repeaters, which are actually a single, uh, very high magnetic field neutron stars that uh, reg regularly emit uh, in gamma rays. And there is uh, uh, some indications that some of these short DRVs can be actually these uh, repeater uh, stars. Um, so there are still unknowns in terms of the, um, the gamma ray bursts, um, what they are and you know, like how um, varied they are. But as I said, um, there is also the um, interesting, another interesting aspect that we can use them to study um, other galaxies and to um, have more information about the early universe to you know, pinpoint the first galaxies and, and uh, to study them. Um, thank you. A question uh, from Richard, who would like to know um, how common are gamma ray bursts really? Because if we see them, this narrow jet has to be pointed at Earth. Yeah, right? that yeah, yeah. That's a that's a, a good question. Um, I don't know the numbers off the top of my head because it's been a few years that I have done active research in this field. But um, I remember that I think, for instance, Swift satellite detects around 150 GRBs per year. So we can calculate from that, uh, like um, the, the the galaxies that are roughly around, and then we know the the angle of the jet from that. So which is um, usually smaller than 30 degrees. Um, so yeah, I mean the, they are not very rare, but uh, as uh, as Richard said, uh, due to the jet nature of the emission, um, we don't uh, necessarily see all of them unfortunately. Um, I'm, going to, I'm going to ask a question that I, I think I, uh, I know is a challenging question. Someone wants to know how is, uh, are the jets formed? Oh yeah, good question. I, it's mainly due to the spin basically, it's angular momentum. So one of the um, um, requirements for these gamma ray bursts is that I was saying they have to be very massive and uh, they need to be low metallicity because they need to be, be spinning very fast. So they need to conserve their angular momentum through their lifetime. And uh, so basically it's just uh, the angular momentum uh, spinning star. It doesn't just explode in all direction because of the spin there, the material uh, flows away in the um, direction of the spin, um, the, of the star spin axis of the star basically. Or, or yeah. Mm, thank you. Um, Angus wants to know, um, is there any evidence that gamma ray bursts have ever caused an extinction here on Earth? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I uh, personally, I don't know. But um, so we do know the, as I said, the, the properties of the, well, but yeah, if it happens, um, what we could see would be just a remnant black hole. So the, the thing with the gamma ray bursts, because the, once they happen, right, after a few days, you don't see anything uh, uh, anymore. So you have to be um, very fast, to, um, you know, uh, point your telescopes, observe the thing and get as much information as you can. And then if it's in, an, in another galaxy, then yes, you can observe the galaxy and study the galaxy. But for an extinction event, it had to be very close to us, right? So it means that uh, everything happens in a few days and what's left over is most likely a black hole. I mean, if it's a neutron star, again, it has to have certain properties like uh, be a pulsar, for instance, for us to be able to observe. Otherwise, it has to be a black hole. And then, which means, you know, unless there is a, a, a companion star, we won't be able to see it. So it's really difficult to judge, uh, you know, what could have been in the past in terms of the gamma ray bursts that are um, near us. Yeah, I'm sure I've I've heard some theories because I think the there was obviously the famous extinction that wiped out the dinosaurs about 65 million years ago, but yeah. there, there was an even bigger one about a bit more than 200 million years ago, and I've heard people hypothesize that. that yeah, I mean it is definitely burst, possible. But... It's just that you know observationally, it is not so easy to you know say okay, I see there is a black hole, you know it might have because again with the, even with the black hole, even if you see a black hole, it 
could have uh, turned into a black hole with just a supernova, uh, which is not as powerful mm -hmm. as gamma ray bursts. So mm -hmm. it's really at this stage, it's mostly speculation, I would say, rather than, you know, uh, astronomy. Um, absolutely, yeah. Um, question from Dylan. Uh, how big is the biggest gamma ray that we've ever seen? Um, so the, I should say, sorry. I'm, I'm guessing it's in terms of the energy. So these are like uh, um, hundred and uh, sorry, um, ten to the fifty-three ergs. Uh, so they are really, really very powerful. I don't know off the top of my head how I can convert this into something <laughs> that makes sense to non-astronomers, but um, you know they are um, like a uh, hundred times more powerful than supernova, which are very, very powerful explosions. So, um, and the, the thing is, the, um, it's not only the peak energy, right? So for, for instance, for long duration gamma ray bursts, it start, uh, goes uh, into burst and then it slowly decays declines, I mean, it slowly fades away, which means there is still a lot of energy uh, in gamma rays coming uh, um, towards us uh, from that source. So um, there is a lot of uh, total energy budget there. Yeah. Um, so I might, I might ask uh, two or three more questions, if that's OK. The, uh, yeah. you, um, everyone is saying this is a fantastic talk. I think you've really oh, piqued their nice. interest. I'm glad to hear that. Um, Scott Armstrong would like to know which one is more powerful. Is it the short term or the long term bursts? Um, it is the, uh, I would say it's the long ones. I mean, the short ones produce a harder um, gamma rays. So it's kind of uh, more um, high frequency, more energy, but because their um, total duration is very, very short, shorter than two seconds, the overall um, budget, energy budget is not that high. Whereas the longer ones, actually there are some that are, um, that took um, several minutes even. So, um, yeah, the, the longer ones are overall more, more energetic. Mm. Um, are gamma ray bursts predictable? Um, yes, um, because um, from all these observations, as I said, we know that the, the most likely source for the long duration gamma ray bursts are these uh, very, very big stars that are spinning very fast. And uh, so, um, what we call Wolf Rayet type stars. So we know, for instance, some Wolf Rayet stars in, in our galaxy, mm -hmm. which will uh, likely to end up with uh, gamma ray bursts, but it is a very long timeline as everything else in, in astronomy, even though the, the burst itself is, is a very short event, the, the life cycle of the star that ends up with the bur burst is a very long one. And then, um, as I said, the short gamma ray bursts are the, um, the binary systems, which has a neutron star in a neutron star or a neutron star in a black hole. And, um, we don't necessarily know all these because they have the, I mean, you cannot observe a neutron star or a black hole uh, unless it is, uh, the, for the neutron stars, um, there are what we call pulsars, for instance, which are pulsating um, light in radio wavelengths or, or some of them in, in X-rays and so on, which then, you know, we know. Um, or otherwise, yeah, so we don't necessarily know which of these systems uh, are um, in in our galaxy, for instance. I mean, in, in other galaxies, our, our telescopes, our technology is not uh, good enough, unfortunately, <laughs> to pinpoint the location of the individual stars. Uh. Sure. Um, so I'm going to make this the last question. I'm sorry, there are questions coming in uh, too fast to answer, but I'm afraid we. I think we need to give our speaker um, a bit of a break after that fantastic talk. Um, so the last question someone would like to know, um, a bit more personal if you don't mind, when did you start studying astronomy and what do you think might be the best way for uh, some young people to start if they're interested in it? Um, I have actually um, not a typical um, journey to, in my career of, as an astronomer. I, study, um, I studied physics, so I started uh, studying physics in Turkey. And I was actually more interested in, in you know, like uh, quantum um, <laughs> electrodynamics and that, and that kind of, um, or general relativity or string theory type of um, more math heavy 
physics. Then I had a fantastic professor, Professor Ali Alpar, who is uh, studying X-ray astronomy. And uh, so it was the thing. I mean, like I never had a telescope as a kid. So I'm, I'm really not your typical astronomer. But uh, so I, I moved to X-ray astronomy during my master's and then uh, went to Germany and uh, actually uh, worked with this front instrument uh, and uh, started. So I, I was actually fascinated when I first heard about uh, gamma ray bursts and, uh, um, and that's how I chose that in, for my um, PhD subject and then eventually ended up here in Cambridge and uh, doing other interesting things on top of those. So yeah, I mean, you know, like uh, there are, there isn't one way to, I would say, um, end up as an astrophysicist or astronomer, but like if, if you really um, like it, want to learn more, you know, like um, start digging into it and, and start learning so for observational um, astronomy, it's more, um, uh, yeah, you need to know statistics, um, you need to know um, programming, and you need to know obviously um, physics and astronomy. And then for theoretical astronomy, it's a, a different uh, thing. You need to know more maths and more physics. So there are, there are many different options and, and different paths to, um, yeah. Yeah, wonderful. I'm, uh, I'm also going to uh, shamelessly plug the YouTube, uh, the YouTube channel that you're watching right now. Yes, exactly. Um, I mean, that's, I think, a fantastic way because there are like lots of different topics which are, you, you know, like current and uh, relevant and uh, exciting, right? Right, exactly. So we have this uh, on the on the YouTube channel that you're watching right now. We have a whole uh, series of talks, uh, specially designed uh, for children. So um, yes, if you want to, uh, if you if you're into that, if you're interested in those, uh, check them out and maybe consider uh, subscribing for all the kind of the fun stuff that we do. Um, wonderful, um, IBK, uh, uh, Dr. IBK Kupchi Oldas, thank you so much uh, for that talk. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, I think you've uh, made a lot of people very uh, interested in this topic. So a uh, virtual round of applause for our speaker. <laughs> and uh, we will see you next week. Uh, next week, we have James Trussler, who's going to be talking about 30 years of the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, so yeah, see you next week. Bye, thank you very much.